Welcome to episode five of Ship, Sea and the Stars with, from Royal Museums Greenwich. We're here every week to share ideas, to share history and culture and science, all the things that are inside the museum. But since you can't visit in person, we're bringing it all to you online. If there's a question that you'd like, if you, the question you'd like answered about the stuff we've been talking about or a topic that you'd like us to talk about in the future, do please let us know. If you look for Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter, you'll find us and we'd love to hear from you. So this week's topic is escaping to the coast. This is the week of the bank holiday weekend, the first uh, week in May. And of course, many of us would go to the coast this, during this week normally, and we can't go, we're stuck at home. And, but even if we can't visit in person, just thinking about the sea, there's a tug of the tide. Humans have a very special relationship with the sea, but mostly we don't go to sea, the sea, we go to the coast. And so we're going to be digging into the topic of the coast this week and our relationship with it. And to help us do that, we've got a curator from Royal Museums Greenwich and also two special guests with their own expertise to bring to this topic. So let me introduce our guests to you. We have Sue Pritchard, who is the Senior Curator of Art at Royal Museums Greenwich. We have Owen Humphreys, who is a press association yeah. photographer, and Dr. David Gange, a historian and author. So just to start with, just to get a couple of lines from each of you about your connection to this topic. Sue, could we start with you? Yes, um, I, I do live in a coastal community, so I have a very strong affinity with the sea, but I'm particularly interested in the tradition of eeriness that runs through 20th and 21st century landscape art and artist's relationship with the uncanny and the sea. Brilliant. Um, Owen, why don't you go next? Yeah, hi. Hi, Helen. Um, yeah, I I'm also uh, live on the coast. Um, you know, I'm out with the camera quite a lot along the coast. Um, and I find taking pictures of, of, of the coast very therapeutic um, and relaxing and, you know, the early mornings and the peacefulness of it but also you know when it is busy and we've got rough seas there's there's lots of different things you can do with the coast when it comes to photography so yeah it, it helps me out a lot with pictures when I'm out and about with the camera. Fabulous and last but not least David. Hello oh, so I'm a historian of Atlantic coastlines but my favourite research tool is my sea kayak so my last project involved kayaking from Shetland down to Cornwall so I spend lots and lots of my time coated in salt. That is clearly the best way to do history. I've, ne I've never, I never was, a, when I was a kid, wanted to be a historian, but if someone had said that to me, I might have changed my mind. <laughs> so we're going to start, to set the scene here, we're going to start with an excerpt describing the seaside. Now, this is from a Charles Dickens uh, sketch, and it was written in, around 1830, illustrating everyday lives and everyday people. So here, read by Simon Kane, is Charles Dickens setting the scene. The Tugses at Ramsgate in Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens. The sun was shining brightly. The sea, dancing to its own music, rolled merrily in. Crowds of people promenaded to and fro. Young ladies tittered. Old ladies talked. Nursemaids displayed their charms to the greatest possible advantage, and their little charges ran up and down and to and fro and in and out, under the feet and between the legs of the assembled concourse in the most playful and exhilarating manner. There were old gentlemen trying to make out objects through long telescopes, and young ones making objects of themselves in open shirt collars, ladies carrying about portable chairs, and portable chairs carrying about invalids, parties waiting on the pier for parties who had come by the steamboat, and nothing was to be heard but talking, laughing, welcoming, and merriment. If the pier had presented a scene of life and bustle to the Tugses on their first landing at Ramsgate, it was far surpassed by the appearance of the sands on the morning after their arrival. It was a fine, bright, clear day with a light breeze from the sea. There were the same ladies and gentlemen, the same children, the same nursemaids, the same telescopes, the same portable chairs. The ladies were employed in needlework or watchguard making or knitting or reading novels. The gentlemen were reading newspapers and magazines. The children were digging holes in the sand with wooden spades and collecting water therein. The nursemaids, with their youngest charges in their arms, were running in after the waves and then running back with the waves after them. And now and then a little sailing boat either departed with a gay and talkative cargo of passengers or returned with a very silent and particularly uncomfortable-looking one. "'Well, I never!' exclaimed Mrs. Tuggs, as she and Mr. Joseph Tuggs and Miss Charlotta Tuggs and Mr. Simon Tuggs, with their eight feet and corresponding number of yellow shoes, seated themselves on four rush-bottomed chairs, which, being placed in a soft part of the sand, forthwith sunk down some two feet and a half. 
Well, I never. Now, one of the many things I love about that excerpt is that it really paints this picture of transformation. You've got all these city people who are normally living grey lives, they're doing sensible things, they're having jobs, and they go to the beach and they suddenly turn into almost a completely different population. And, and, and yet we would all recognise that, it's so modern. And um, Sue, what struck you about all of that? Um, I think it is that sense of um, that vibrancy of the beach. It's where you are able to kind of transgress your normal life. You can take off your clothes, you can get on the sand, you can do the things that you wouldn't perhaps normally do in your normal day-to-day -day life. There's a sense of freedom, but also there is a sense of variety in, in how different people interact with that particular space, whether you're doing your needlework or you're you're looking at the sea or you're looking for a periscope there's a real sense of everybody is involved in something very active it's not a passive experience um brilliant yes i absolutely and the knitting knitting on the beach it, we'll probably see that again these days and <laughs> owen what struck you about all of that yeah it, it pretty much uh, what she was saying is um you see i think people come to the coast it, you see everyone on the coast everyone seems to be very happy and relaxing and it's, it seems to be sort of that break from say the concrete jungle or the big cities where people can come to the coast like you say with the kids and all that you know the kids can enjoy themselves that you can almost sit there relax let the kids play in the sand you know obviously you've got your ice creams and all that that the kids enjoy i think it's just it's mainly it's, it's that getaway and that that sense of freedom on the, on the beach and you know you, you sit there and you don't see many people sitting on the beach looking miserable do you it's, it's like everyone seems to be <laughs> happy and enjoying themselves and and i think that's what it's all about and I think, you know, that, that's the main, a lot of the reason why people come to the coast, not just to top up the tans, but just to the freedom of the coast. You're making everyone feel worse now because they're all cooped up and can't go. David, how about you? What, what did you take away from that excerpt? So, um, yeah, this is, this is so soon after the supposed discovery of the seaside and at the point where the first coastal railway lines were being built. And from that, you just get a sense of the kind of sudden, really fast kind of ingenuity of people inventing things to do on the coastline. That nice moment. I'd never thought about that. I'd never thought about having to invent invent the modern seaside. Um, so was that? So that came along with the railway that then people could get to the get there and and suddenly they had to work out what to do. Yeah, with the increased leisure of the early nineteenth century and with and with the railway, suddenly lots more people going to the beach and this explosion of of ideas of what you should do when you get there you, that you hear so many of from, from those sketches. What is fascinating about that is that the activities on that, the list that Dickens described are not that different from activities today. So clearly they either got it right first time or we all lack a lot of imagination. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's move on to our first exhibit today. And this is, um, before we get to your exhibit, Sue, because this, this idea of talking about the coast was your idea. And I just wondered if you could introduce the topic of our relationship with the coast a little bit. Yes, well, I think, um, as I said in our, our previous conversation, you know, we are an island nation. We're never more than 70 miles from the sea. And we have a very strong tradition of marine art in this country. Um, and it was really introduced by um, the dream team of father and son, the Dutch Van der Velders. Um, and they were artists who were actually invited to this country by Charles II. Um, and they actually did set up their studio in the Queen's House in 1672. Um, and basically, at that point, marine art was very much focused on that idea of representations of um, ships and naval action. So it was almost a form of, as you were, uh, photojournalism. So um, there was a very strong um, sense of being able to portray accurately um, the ships themselves. So the um, uh, ship's appearance of the hull, the rigging, um, the sails, it was very much that focus on the technology of the ship and in a way the sort of seascape and the landscape was just a sort of background and played second fiddle to the concentration on the ship so it was really much about that technology um, and then in the 18th century um, it's much more about the picturesque and you're getting artists who are focusing on the landscape focusing on the seascape purely because they can't travel at war with, with France and they're not allowed to go on the grand tour um, let's, this maybe get to your, let's maybe get to your first, uh, your exhibit here, which is um, Gad Cliff by John Everett. So, and it is an example of this, that the, the lots of seascape going on here. Tell us about this. Yeah, so absolutely. So this follows in that tradition of the, the picturesque and that idea of artists migrating to the coastline and the Jurassic Coast 
um, was really um, somewhere that our artists were really very much inspired by. Um, and Effort was a Dorset lad. He was born in Dorset. Um, he was part of, um, I suppose, if you like, a sort of minor aristocracy. Um, his, his parents were friends with um, Thomas Hardy. He went to the Slade School of Art. He was part of that Catholic culture. But he had a very strong sense of um, that immersion in the Dorset landscape. Um, and in 1903, he moves to, to um, Dorset with his wife, um, just prior to the birth of his child. And he spends a lot of time painting outside, plain air painting. Um, and Gad Cliff is somewhere where he draws this inspiration. And you can see this sense of his um, preoccupation with um, clouds, with light, um, with shade. You've got this enormous sort of rock face that appears out of the left-hand side. Um, of the painting, illuminated by, by the sun. But you've got the dark, brooding nature of the clouds and the sea is thundering against the bottom of the cliff, that sense of erosion of the natural landscape. But there's also, amidst this sense of trauma and perhaps darkness, there is a sense of hope because you can see on the right-hand side of the painting, you can actually see the glimmer of a blue sky and a rainbow. So it's very much this sense of the sublime, the picturesque, which is imbued in this painting, um, and which is something that, that um, Everett is very much known for. And he's obviously, you know, there's, there's a prescient thing, the modern day, because I, I mean, I grew up in the north of England, going to the coast in the north of England. Someone was always hoping they might be able to see a patch of blue sky over there. Um, I was never convinced as a child, but someone thought it was there. Um, and, but then Everett changed his style, didn't he? So we've got the second painting that you've chosen here of, of the merchant ship. So this is a very different style and theme. It's completely different, and I think this is what is absolutely fascinating by Everett. Um, as I say, he was he's probably one of the most, our most prolific maritime marine artists. Um, and he spends his entire life, you know, he actually does embark on 16 voyages. He's, he's somebody who understands ships, understands being at sea. And then suddenly, with the, um, with the start of World War I, he's unable to go to the coast. The coast is out of bounds for security reasons, for coastal defences. You're not allowed to paint and sketch on the coastline. But he's extremely fortunate in that the Ministry of Information actually does employ him to basically enter the ports and, and sketch and paint the ports. And I think this painting is absolutely fascinating because in terms of style, it is completely different. And Everett hasn't focused perhaps on a traditional view of the hustle and bustle of a port scene. He's actually homed in, and what you see here is basically a glimpse of a dazzle ship. Um, and he was really intrigued by dazzle. Dazzle is a form of camouflage, or rather less about camouflage and more about concealment. Um, so it was really difficult for the, the, um, the, the Navy, and the Merchant Navy in particular, um, who were actually being completely bombarded by um, German submarines. So they had to come up a way to kind of disrupt the view of the ship um, at sea. So if you can imagine being a submarine commander, you're looking through your periscope and suddenly what you see is an extraordinary pattern of zigzag lines in bright colours. And you're not entirely sure which is actually the stern, and which is the bow. So your, your view is completely disrupted and it, it kind of cuts across that idea of becoming a target. Um, and so Everett paints... A confusion. Complete very confusion. Um, so Everett is completely intrigued by this idea of pattern and design on the side of ships. Um, and has completely kind of changed his way of thinking about painting and creates a whole body of work around convoys, merchant convoys, um, and dazzle painting, which he becomes very known for throughout the First World War and indeed has an exhibition in London in 1918. And it's a, it's a, it's a great, um, the whole concept of dazzle camouflage says a lot about how we see the sea as well. That's, you know, that looking at the horizon. That's, that's brilliant. We're going to move on from, from exploration of the horizon with dazzle chips on to exploration of the coast. And there is something that when you think about it, what you might do at the coast, one of the things on the list is always exploration because things are always changing. There's always another rock pool or another sandbank. There's always something new at the coast. And so David has, as he said, has just finished uh, exploring a section of Britain's coast. Uh, the book he wrote is called The Frayed Atlantic Edge. And um, David, just before we get on to your first exhibit, just tell us a little bit about that journey. How long did it take you and, and what were you looking for? Okay, so I did it in, in 12 parts. 
one part each month over a year and um, yeah, spent basically two weeks of each month out in the kayak. So Shetland for the first month and then Orkney for the next and then covered all the Atlantic coasts of Britain and Ireland by the end of the year. Um, and the point was to try and get quite a different perspective on the geography of the British Isles. So um, first five months, sorry, the first seven months of those 12 were all in Scotland. Um, I'd traveled for five months before I reached the second town with more than 600 people. And there are so many other languages along that route as well. I like so such a large proportion of that journey was spent in places where English wasn't actually the first language. It really gives you a very changed perspective on on what Britain and Ireland are. And you do get you do get such a different view of coasts from the sea. Even here in London, if I'm on the Thames in a in a in a, a canoe, if even looking at the banks of the Thames, you see. <laughs> So, so seeing your own country differently must be a, a whole step up on that. Yeah, and, and also kind of thinking environmentally too, like the, that worldview from really low inside the wave is absolutely unique and other species don't quite see you as human. So um, they, they can see how clumsy a seafarer you are in comparison to them. So whales and otters and gannets will approach you in ways they wouldn't do otherwise. And you are constantly negotiating with these forces that are much, much stronger than you in the waves and the tides as well. So your perspective on what it means to be human is changed as much as your perspective on what it means to be British. And that shapes the, the histories we might write as well. And a, a reminder that the sea is not your natural environment and the otters are going to outclass you basically at every turn. Well, yeah, let's get on to... <laughs> let's get on to your, your first exhibit, which is um, a painting of Pegwell Bay, which has loads of stuff in it. So, so tell us a little bit about the themes that, that come through in this painting. Okay, so yeah, it used to be um, talk about coasts and especially cliffs as though they were kind of somehow timeless, like lasting boundaries around the nation, something like that. But in fact, it's the most, like, the most time rich kind of places that we can imagine. So I think there's something really unusual about the way when people go to the coast, they might visit sites and museums and like do dinosaurs in the morning and Vikings in the afternoon. Um, and again and again, coasts have been the places that things that have changed our views about what Britain is have come from. Most, I guess the most obvious example of that might be ichthyosaurs appearing out of the Lyme Regis cliffs before the concept of the dinosaur was even invented. And I think this picture represents all of that. So it was painted by the Scottish painter William Dice um, after he visited, he and his family visited Pegwell Bay in October 1858. Um, but it really isn't a carefree seaside jaunt at all. Um, the family are engaged in this really common Victorian hobby of fossil collecting on the beach. And they are there to kind of represent short human timescales. And it's worth noting that this was, this was one of Charles Darwin's favorite beaches as he was writing on the origin of species. And also the beach that St. Augustine is said to have arrived to convert Britain um, on. So as a kind of human beach, it's got pretty much everything. Um, then, the middle ground of the painting behind this family um, represents a different time scale altogether. So it's the kind of cliffs that every storm would drag fossils out of. So representing geological time, a different time scale that was just kind of being discovered at this time. And then behind that, you've got something even more awful and terrifying and huge. Um, you can just about make out in the sky um, the Nazi's comet that was passing um, or that was visible in the sky um, on the 5th of October 1858 which is so the, just to be clear yes it's right up in the top of the middle of the picture it's a white streak going through um, so there you have vast astronomical time and we're supposed to then look back to this family in the foreground and see how detached from each other they are and see this as being quite a bleak painting um, the kind of weight of these different time scales kind of pressing down on these people in the foreground. Um, although I think maybe for us today, um, less invested perhaps in the idea of permanence, this might be quite exciting rather than um, as horrifying as it was supposed to be to viewers at the time. Attitudes to change do, do shift over time quite a lot, don't they? We have, we have lots to get through, but I do want to see, uh, on the topic of items that wash up on the beach, I do want you to show us uh, one of the things that you found. Okay, so, oh, well, I don't find it as, as we're seeing it, 
But um, yeah, as a kayaker, you're always struck by the kind of weirdness of the landforms around you, kind of realizing that hills you see were once kind of sandbanks in Canadian riverbeds or whatever. Um, and one of my favorite places for experiencing those kind of things is Papa Westray, little island in Orkney that's just full of incredible Neolithic, medieval, modern things thrown together. I mean, last time I was there, there was like a 1980s TV set washed up on the beach amongst all the Neolithic and um, medieval remains, and it just felt just as much of an artifact like they did. Um, but one of the islanders gave me this, which is an oyster shell dug up by rabbits at the Nap of Hauer, which is the, the oldest um, house in Britain. Um, so this is from perhaps a meal um, several thousand years ago, um, just kind of recovered by rabbits very recently. Rabbits are the new archaeologists. You heard it here first. Oh, they're, they're the original archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Well, we get it on, on, you know, on the topic of um, things being on the beaches. I was just going to pick up, there's a quote from uh, an, exhibit, an exhibition that the National Maritime Museum had a few years ago that was called The Great British Seaside. And at the time, someone uh, who was quoted in that expedition talked a little bit about, he said, at the seaside, you get to experience the simpler things. When kids lark about on the beach, surely it's better than spending hours in a darkened room playing video games. So in these days of smartphones and video games, are, still, are kids still larking about on the beach? Well, I'm hoping that Owen can tell us. And Owen's photography career is astonishing and extremely impressive. And he's taken photographs of everybody famous you've ever heard of and every famous location you can imagine, as far as I can tell. Um, but he's been out on the beach near where he lives recently. And Owen, tell us a little bit about what you've been seeing there. Yeah, I mean, obviously times are a bit different at the moment. So, um, you know, things are slightly different down the coast. There's not as many people there as what you would uh, normally see, which um, in the current climate is a good thing. Um, but obviously people are still wanting to go down the beach and take their, uh, their required exercise at this moment in time. Um, and again it's everyone seems to be certainly where i live and around the beaches around here seems to be complying with all sorts of all, all the rules the government have laid down and and still getting out and walking their dogs um and also you know enjoying the, the fresh air of, of the coast we, we've been very lucky up here on the northeast we've had some very good weather um which i think uh, if the weather had been bad and raining uh, like we normally get it would have been a lot more difficult for people um but at the moment, uh, when I say the coasts are busy, that they're, they're, they're not busy, but they, they have people still here, but yeah, using the social, oh, yeah, you, so shot, still social distancing, but getting, you know, and, and some nice fresh air and time down. And you've been out photographing these pebble stacks, and I love these. Let's see these pictures yeah. and, and tell us about what, what exactly are these things doing there? And, well, and how many are there? Well, I mean, I, I used to I used to live um, very close to this, and I used to go down there quite a few mornings, and um, they weren't there then. And I think from what I can, can gather, it started off with one or two. And what, what was happening is people were coming down the coast, getting for their exercise, and sort of building these pebble stacks, which, like you, I think are very impressive. Um, and, and and I think it sort of evolved into sort of a thing of like a community kind of feel to it because once it had started others started doing it and it's grown and grown and grown and now I mean I saw that the first time I visited there was um maybe one or two hundred now I'd say there's, there's close to a thousand and it goes on for nearly half a mile um but I think it's that sort of feeling of, of everyone coming together and doing their doing their stack and then the next person doing theirs and yeah it's, it's, it's a nice sight to see and, and, and I love the NHS one I thought that was a really nice touch someone had you know done that uh, you know for the NHS and it, and it really stands out amongst the rest of them that one. It really speaks to you know the power of simplicity doesn't it because it is in a way it, when it comes to activities putting one stone on top of another stone is the most simple thing you can possibly do and yet when thousands of people do the same thing it suddenly becomes something else and you can't stop looking at it. Yeah I mean I shouldn't admit it but I did try one and uh, I wasn't as good as a uh, lot of them at it. Now, <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah ob obviously most people are very good at it because there, there are quite a few there and one thing that I have seen when I have been down there you've not got crowds and crowds of people all building one at the same time it seems to be that when one's doing it another person will wait and then they will come on and they will then build one as well so it, it, it kind of worked quite well and i think like i said it's brought a community along the coast together quite a bit i think and it, and it also gives someone gives people something to look at it's like a, a big sculpture 
you know, sculpture park all the way along the beach. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because you would say, you know, the beaches are occupied, but they're not busy. But if you've got thousands of pebble piles, then there's something there about one person does something and a bit later someone else comes by. And over time, a lot of people have clearly visited that beach. It's just that it's not visible. In yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, maybe if there was a time lapse set up and how many people were coming there, it'd be a very interesting kind of subject to sort of see on how people have come at different times in the day and how they've used their time, you know, out of the house along the beach and, and where they've been i mean obviously once it has been in the media people are wanting to take their exercise and come and have a look at this um the pebble stacks it's it's so inventive i love that kind of simplicity yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> it's great this is a uh, ship sea and the stars the weekly broadcast from royal museums greenwich and this week we're talking about escape to the coast uh we've got we're talking about uh, we've got curator sue pritchard photographer owen humphreys and academic and author David Ganges. Um, And we're going to move on to the question of language. And to set us up for this, we have a very brief poem uh, written by Vagaland and read by Simon Kane. It's called Bound is the Boatless Man. Fragments of battered timber, teak, larch, enduring oak, but from them may be fashioned keel, hassan, ruth and stroke. A homely vessel, maybe. We build as best we can to take us out of bondage. Bound is the boatless man. David, you suggested this to me. Tell us a little bit about the the consequences of being a boatless man. Why is it that this um, flotsman jetsam at the coast is so important to the people in this poem? And so, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots we, we could say about this one, about the kind of ingenuity of coastal living, the need to be making, repairing hands-on life all the time, about the kind of bounty of the sea in driftwood that was absolutely essential for kind of being able to move around at that time, now might just get made into tables and lamps and various kind of driftwood things, um, about the threat of the sea as well, remembering that all the bits of driftwood here might well have come from wrecks of boats previously destroyed by the sea, but also about interconnection. Um, this is a Faroese proverb made by Vargaland, kind of national poet of Shetland, into this iconic piece of Shetland literature. So a reminder of how um, coastal places mix those different influences up in lots of different ways. And yet yeah, that idea that you say, freedom, that um, family having a boat, for a family having a boat means prosperity, just like for people visiting the coast today, having a kayak or a surfboard or a dinghy um, gives this kind of immense sense of um, freedom and waves. So the poem is talking about these bits and pieces of wood that you might find on the beach. If you know what to do with them, you can create a keel, you can build yourself a boat and then you're not beholden to anyone else. So these things that look as though they're incidental in the landscape actually can become a living if you know how to use them. Yeah, and I, I think the, the terminology, all the kind of terms in here is, is really interesting too, showing just how much kind of unique language there is in terms of yeah, technologies, um, but also remembering that the coast is also the most biodiverse space we have. And in somewhere like Shetland, where Vargaland was, more words for seaweed than most of us could possibly imagine. So this really specialised terminology and language of each bit of the coastline. And obviously the coastline... Let's, let's, I'm going to pick you up on that there. Just a bit, but let's get on to the idea of coastal language because you, your mm-hmm. actual exhibit for, this, uh, for us here is a video about Alfie. Now, this is uh, the start of a film made by Roseanne Watt. And this is it's a beautiful example of coastal language. So here is Alfie. I was young, very few people would eat, eat mackerel because if you left them to rot, well, it took overnight even with hot weather, and in a few days they'd be all covered in black, but we get clocks. And if you did that with headaches or that, that was white maids they get it, rolling them. Well, I came in Borough Hill, very few would eat mackerel. Superstition was bad too. And when I was started fishing, and I stuck 
the knife after gotten in the marsh they were rampant. She said that that would bring wind, things like that. We couldn't mention a minister. I mind there we had a man aboard and Wesley and Kirk and Burra, this new minister was called. And we were coming dragging this there pole and when this minister came and he slapped them and ran the other way. And we couldn't mention salmon either in a boat. Like said, we couldn't mention Salky. That was terrible unlucky. Rabbit. Some men had nearly died if they'd say the rabbit aboard the boat. Right, the first thing I should say is don't feel bad if you couldn't understand a word of that. <laughs> because that's the kind of the point, isn't it, David? So tell us about where Alfie is from and why it is that we have no idea what he's saying. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, obviously we, we, the coastlines of Britain are the places that languages other than English um, and I have their roots and have their kind of strongest communities. These are languages that are ever more vibrant, but I wanted to bring Alfie in to remind us that we're not just talking about languages like Scottish Gaelic and Welsh, um, but that with all the varieties of things like um, coastal forms of Scots, it's impossible to say how many languages exist on our coastlines. Alfie is, Alfie is speaking something that I, I would be resistant to anyone saying isn't a language and is a, a dialect. Again, building all that unique vocabulary out of the species of the sea and things like that. Um, so... What was he talking about? Just to clarify for those who could, was he, was he, he was talking about the, his experience of living at the coast. Yeah, so he's out fishing mackerel and he's saying that in the past um, Shetlanders didn't eat much mackerel because it went off so quickly. Talking about what went wrong with the mackerel and then he's talking about the different superstitions at sea the words that you're not allowed to say on a boat because they bring bad luck, like indeed rabbits. Um, archaeologists can say it, but sailors can't. I didn't know sailors weren't supposed to say rabbits. I've probably offended a lot of uh, hardcore sailors <laughs> in the past. Um, so, but there's this thing about language in the coast, isn't there? The poets, you know, we often hear about famous uh, writers, for example, going to the coast and and it, there's an experience at the coast which does change language. What, what, tell us a little bit about that. Why is it that, that language is such an important thing at the coast? Um, so a part of that is, is the exchange of cultures. The, these are, the coasts are outward looking places where kind of Danish influences might mix with Irish influences and so on. So different bits of a different dialect being picked up. Again, places where you need that really technical language. So yeah, lots of literary figures traveled to, from cities to the coast. Virginia Woolf is unthinkable without her language of waves and fins and things, for instance. But then um, poets actually from the coastlines tend to produce these really kind of unique and powerful voices. Like Roseanne Watts's book called Modern Eye is a wonderful example of that. Um, I love the idea of coast because we tend to forget, we tend to think the land ends at the coast, but actually if you're a, a coast person, the, the coast is just the beginning of where you can go to or where things come from. And there's coast, a difference. Coasts aren't the edges really, they're the, they're the centre of everything, aren't they? Well, I'm an oceanographer, I'm biased, I think the ocean is the centre of everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to move on to just in terms of the ideas that come from coast. And, you know, we have these, in, in, especially in art, I guess, there's these two contrasting views which is the the very pretty jolly hooray for the coast everyone's happy and then this really grim frightening view of the sea and um, so we're going to move to sue and and sue has picked a wonderful painting for us from the uh, museum's collections and this was painted by edward wadsworth so tell us a little bit about him sue and tell us about this painting wadsworth is a really interesting character he's probably one of the most major figures of british art in the um, first half of the 20th century um, he was an active participant in a number of key events. He was um, a founder member of the Vorticists, um, a movement that really celebrated modernity and technology. Um, but he was also involved in the supervision of painting of camouflage scenes in, in Liverpool. Um, and that kind of adoption of, adapt, of abstraction was really important in terms of creating those zigzag patterns in, in camouflage. Um, and what was really interesting with, with Wadsworth is that he changes his, his artistic practice completely after the war. Um, he destroys all of the woodblocks that he made of um, dazzle ships. 
um, all of that sense of modernity, that celebration of technology, um, has really kind of destroyed for him that sense of um, artistic innovation. And he takes himself off down to um, Newlyn with his wife. And they walk back, they decide to walk back from Newland to London along the Jurassic coastline. And I think this is where he starts to re-engage with that sense of, of nature and the landscape. And it's almost um, a kind of turning point for him. He takes himself off to France and he creates a series of um, images based on, on harbours and ports. But rather than celebrating the technology in the harbour scenes, he starts to create a very, almost a sort of post-apocalyptic tranquility around his work. There's a real sense of stillness. You get that amazing light that you get in the south of France. Um, and you still get that sense of he's interested in, in form in terms of those vertical um, lines that he's creating with the, with the, um, with the, the ships and with the lighthouse. But he's more interested in creating this almost sense of strange calm, an unsettled calm, an eeriness which imbues this, this painting. It's something that he then takes forward into the 30s where he focuses much more, he embraces surrealism and focuses much more on the detritus of, of what I call the that hinterland between land and sea, where you get a lot of um, naval architecture, you know, you get the abandoned boats, the abandoned um, buildings, you get the, the, the lost anchors, the, um, the sort of detritus that you find washed up on the coastline. Um, and I think this is what I find so It's an interesting comparison, isn't it? Because we have this phrase, you know, that we use today, which is the calm before the storm. And, and that's the assumption that, you know, the eye of the storm goes past that and basically you're waiting. You know it's coming, you're waiting. But actually what you're talking about is the other way around, that the storm has been. Yeah. And now what you've got is the bits that are left over. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and for somebody who was, you know, totally in 100% um, an advocate, as I say, of modernity and technology and celebrated in, in some respects that kind of concept of war, um, to turn around and create something that was completely different. And as I say, that sort of unsettled feeling that in some way civilization has, has kind of destroyed itself and what's left a lot of man-made objects but without the the actual person there it's almost like um archaeology isn't it you know digging back if an archaeologist digs back to a layer what they see are the the, the artifacts but they don't see the people there's a, yeah. a process I, of deduction and i think I, the thing that i was particularly drawn with with, with the um, the stone stacks again is that sense of eeriness where somebody has created these, of the, these kind of sculptures, uh, but then if you see them without the person, the maker, they become something other. They're completely, very compelling, but also very unworldly. You're not entirely sure what's going on there. So there's, a, there's definitely, you know, this, this discomfort, this disconnect associated with coast, but we're going to move on now to subversion. Let's move from just being a bit awkward to actually uh, doing things you shouldn't do. So Owen, you've got some some more wonderful coastal photographs to tell us, uh, to show us. But first of all, tell us about this photo with the surfers. Yeah, the, the photo with the surfers. Um, I was driving along the top uh, top road of the coast towards Thai, this is actually Thai Mouth Long Sands. Uh, and I, I just looked along the, the beach and obviously with, was, the waves were fantastic, but the light was just catching them uh, just perfect for a picture to make that beautiful silhouette with the whites and the blacks and obviously the action and, and the fact that they're all riding these, um, these waves. It was more for me about sort of the light um, without the right light, that picture wouldn't have the same impact at all. Um, it just so happened that this was uh, on the first or second day, I can't remember exactly, of the uh, official government lockdown. Um, I posted the picture as just a general surfing picture um, on social media and quite a few other outlets. Um, I think it made uh, the Daily Telegraph and a couple of other papers, um, if not online. Um, but it got the surfers, uh, sorry, the public, um, sort of really objected to them being in the water and uh, it turned into quite a big debate about should they or shouldn't they be in the water um, during the lockdown. Um, the government hadn't made it 100% clear however the RNLI and other sort of coastal people had sort of said look please don't go in we could do without the extra sort of work if you know what I mean. 
So yeah, then the surfers then kind of turned a little bit um, and they weren't too happy with the picture. Uh, if that picture had been taken at any other time, they would have been probably ringing me, ringing me up for a picture, for a print of themselves surfing. It just so happened that the negative publicity they got um, really it was, you know, the public made their own mind upon it, really. But it's interesting, is it, the freedom? Because one of the things that goes with that image, as well as the, the majesty of the sea, is, is the freedom of a human, which is one of the things about surfing, that the, there's this mm. balancing act. You're balancing on nature and you can't look down and, and you caught that moment so beautifully. Yeah. Um, and yet the coast, you know, the coast is, is the, is the sea free of all these restrictions on land. There's this contrast between the yeah, sea and, it, there it, and it, those kind of locked down. It's a very difficult one, isn't it? It's, it's, you know, there's an argument for both sides of whether people should be in the water or shouldn't. It's a, it's a very tough one. I think the, the biggest problem is, is when other people that aren't local, maybe that, can walk down there as they're exercising and go in the sea I think when people were sort of driving by and seeing them in the sea it then encourages maybe people to come from a further distance bring their cars and come down to the beach so yeah it's a difficult one to police and it's and it's a, an argument of two sides on I'm not really sure personally what's right and what's wrong on, on that one I mean for me personally I think it's more you know take the advice from the RNLI and people like that and if they say keep out then I think at this sort of time, then people maybe should. Um, but it's an, but it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because the coast is a very exposed place. And if mm. you are going to break the rules, if you do it on the coast, everyone is going to see you because there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> no, that's right. And to be honest, the police have been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of patrols and been checking the coast on a regular basis. Um, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough call on whether it's, uh, the, the, you know, you see a lot of people on their bikes down the coast. Is that much different? You see a lot of people walking on the beach, um, keeping their distance. Um, so, yeah, in the water, it would seem that it's quite sort of free. Yeah. So let's, let's have a look at some of the other photos, because also the, the, one of the other things is that coastal images, especially ones as good as yours, are very cheering. They're uplifting or they can be. So maybe tell us a little bit about some of these other images and how, yeah. how important it is to convey some optimism as well. Yeah, well, I think because I've you know covered it from day one, um, you know what's been happening around the uh, the COVID nineteen. Um, you know, I think that, that there's a need for people's mental health and people to still see that there is normality out there still, even with this terrible pandemic. And I think you know some of the the more brighter and and cheery pictures. I think you've got to get the balance right to not showing coronavirus stories day in day out 24 7 i think to see um you know some nice images and you know something else i mean there we go there's an astro picture i did um only a couple of weeks ago which was actually on the night of the lyrids uh, Ly uh, meteor shower and I, I knew that the milky way would be good but i didn't expect i'd be catching the northern lights as well which is another thing i love taking pictures of so you caught the Northern Lights from the northeast of England. That's that's pretty good going, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I set out um, a few years ago on a big project, which um, is on a lot of my social media, to try and capture as many locations in Northumberland with the Northern Lights and show people what you can see on the coast um, when most people are asleep. Um, and actually, the Northern Lights is, uh, is very visible on the in, in the right conditions along the coast. It is one of the astonishing things about the Northern Lights is that they are there all the time, but you have to be in the right situation to see them. I was very, so you can do these uh, flights, well, not at the moment, obviously, but you can, in theory, do flights uh, out over Iceland in a plane and, and they black out all the lights on. That's the right, yeah. And then you can see the Northern Lights. And the thing that got me about that is that I have been on a plane in over the North Atlantic at night time, plenty of times before, and I never saw the Northern Lights. Why no. don't they turn out all the lights every time? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. There. It, there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, I actually run, um, I actually run photo workshops to Iceland, um, shooting the Northern Lights, and yeah, I, I've actually not been so lucky enough to see them um, as I've been coming into land in Iceland. The times I've been, um, I've seen them many a times and photographed them in Iceland, but not, 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 not been lucky enough on an aeroplane yet. So, and, and there is, you know, just to go back to the coastal images, um, it's interesting that, you know, the government has put many parts of the media on the key workers list because actually getting information from the outside and seeing that the world is still there, even if we can't go there, is really important. And how does it, it's, is it a bit weird to have key worker status like that? Or do you feel that, you know, this is something where you can really contribute? Yeah, no, I think it's um, something we can really contribute um, on, 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 
diff totally a lot of different aspects. Obviously, I mean, yesterday I was in the Nightingale Hospital up here doing stuff for the NHS and doing stuff, um, you know, on, on that side of it. The, uh, this morning I was out doing uh, the, the super moon setting and also a sunrise. So, like I was mentioned earlier, I think it's it, it's getting a balance to show people. Um, I mean, tomorrow um, I'll be doing the uh, um, preparations and on Friday it'll be the day. And so there is going to be sort of, you know, different subjects to cover that I still think we need to feed to the public around the coronavirus news as well, which which I'm also doing at the, you know, at the same time. And it's important so everyone can know from this and from your photos that the coast is still there. So we might not be able to go, but it is there and waiting for us. Those of us who are not living, lucky enough to live at the coast, it's there and waiting for us when we come back. We are out of time, which is terrible because there's, there's so much about the coast to talk about. Uh, but if you have got more questions about what you've heard, do get in contact with us via social media, uh, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Look for Royal Museums Greenwich and we'll do our best to answer your questions. The museum is currently closed to visitors, but there are lots of activities. If you go to the website, rmg.co.uk, there's lots of things going on. Um, we are starting to fundraise. So if, if you are, if you fancy doing a charity event or you, or you fancy making a donation to the museum, obviously the, it, the closure is having a major financial impact. And so there is now um, a page at donate.rmg.co.uk uh, where you can find out about donation. But there's also lots to do and listen to and see and interact with. So do go to the webpage and have a look at all of that. Next week, it is Museum Week. I think every week's Museum Week. But anyway, next week is a special Museum Week. And so every year, galleries, archives and libraries from around the world come together to celebrate what makes museums special. This year, the theme is togetherness and so that's what we'll be talking about next week so I hope you can join us then uh, I've just it only remains me to thank our fabulous and very knowledgeable contributors Sue Pritchard David Gange and Owen Humphreys thank you to uh, Simon Kane for the readings to Steve Thompson for our music James Gill was the producer I'm Helen Chersky see you next week <laughs>